Very welcome to everyone for joining us today on this Echohow webinar series. We have got a fantastic webinar coming up for you, me and Mac. We are so excited about this one. We are going to be speaking about Wi-Fi security, how we can minimize vulnerabilities and identifying rogue devices. So some intros then for myself and my wonderful co-host, Mac Daring. We are both the directors of Echohow University and product marketing. Over to you, Mac. I'm very good. Thank you very much for asking, Matt. I hope that you are very good as well, <laughs> my friend. <laughs> so welcome, everyone. We are excited to be here as always. And today's webinar has a special place in our hearts because we like talking about security and everyone wants to talk about security because it's a very important topic, as simple as that. So we will start with showing you how to use Eka, how to track down the security threats and know about physical security vulnerabilities in your premises. Yeah, and we are going to be showing you the impact that these devices have on your Wi-Fi network performance. Then we will dive straight into some Wi-Fi security theory. And then finally, we're going to show you some alternative options to using captive portals for your guest Wi-Fi networks. So shall we jump straight into it? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's talk about some stats and some background about the security. Why do we care about the security in your Wi-Fi networks? I will start with the example that is close to me, which is my house. I have 63 Wi-Fi IoT devices associated to my radios, to my access points. And all of these devices, they probably can be compromised a little bit easier than my laptops or smartphones. I have uh, Wi-Fi bulbs, I have Wi-Fi printers, I have Wi-Fi hoovers. Some of the devices, they might be used to be bridged into my network. So I have to be extremely careful with that. And the attacks on the IoT network are on the rise, as Matt can uh, tell us now. Yeah, cybersecurity is such a big hot topic at the moment because, like Max said, it is really on the rise at the moment. We were just researching before the uh, webinar and we uh, come across the uh, stats from Kaspersky. And from January to June this year, there's already been 1.5 billion, B with billion, breaches of the IoT devices. That's pretty scary. And that's actually increased from 2020 by 639 million. So it's really important that we pay close attention to our security of our networks and making sure that we're making them as secure as possible. And we're going to show you how we can leverage Echohow to do that. So now let's talk about the rogue devices. But before that, I did see on a chat that people are talking a lot about my robo hoovers. I not only have robo hoovers, I also have like a robo mowers all connected to Wi Fi. So there is more tools. Uh, and toys that you can uh, use to get into my home Wi-Fi network. So let's talk about Wi-Fi rogue uh, devices. So what is a rogue device? There are several types of rogue devices. So when you have a rogue AP, for example, the definition of that is the access point that is connected physically to your network and sits physically in the premises of your site. So that not only can create a massive security threat as you can connect to that access point and gain access to the network physically, uh, but also it creates issues with the RF, where it eats up very valuable airtime. And the other types of rogues, they can be interfering APs that might be the access points that are physically present in your space, but not necessarily connected to your network. Just for simplicity reasons, we will just refer to them as rogue devices. Yeah, so why are these potentially security vulnerabilities? And from doing vast amounts of Wi-Fi surveys over the last few years. And the examples we're going to show you is that a lot of the customers that when they come across these devices, these devices on the network, may they be printers, may they be TVs or any other kind of devices. Usually these devices are not really monitored so well. And the password or the pre-shared key to access these devices, they're the default ones that come stuck on the back of those devices and they don't get updated. So if someone knows that, password or it's an easily crackable password, then you, it's a very weak method that people could use to access the corporate network. 
and the firmware in these devices, it's impossible to track. So I have devices from multiple vendors, tons of different vendors. I don't have a single dashboard to track a firmware of all of my devices. So it's very difficult to stay on top of things. And old firmware or a vulnerable firmware can be used to get access into your network. Yeah, and, and actually recently before the webinar, me and Stu were having a conversation about one of the uh, sites that he had visited and there was a, a TV that was installed in the wall of an office somewhere and the TV didn't move. So if the device doesn't move, the right thing to do is cable it and they had installed a cable to the TV. They had also disabled the Wi-Fi radios of the TV because it had that LAN connectivity. It didn't need to have the Wi-Fi enabled. But what happened was that after there was a firmware update on this TV, it actually re-enabled the Wi-Fi radios of that TV. And on 2.4 gigahertz, it started to use a 40 megahertz wide channel. Um, so we're going to be taking a look at that in a moment's time as well, why that can cause us issues. But sometimes when devices update their firmware, even though you've done the right thing in the first place by disab disabling those Wi-Fi radios, there's a chance that they could re-enable them as well. And also we'll take a look at how to find and monitor these devices, see where they are, see how many of the rogue devices, interfering devices, they can be Wi-Fi, they can be wireless, not Wi-Fi, but still interfering with Wi-Fi. How do we find them and what do we do about that? Yeah, and we're going to take a look and talk about how that really does impact the performance of the Wi-Fi. Is it down to the co-channel interference or co-channel contention, however you like to call it? Does it cause adjacent channel interference, primary, secondary, OBSS? So actually, we're going to talk about that in a bit more detail in the next slide and give you some real-world examples that we've tested in our environments. Okay, so let's take a look at this simple example. Let's assume that we have just two Wi-Fi stations, Wi-Fi clients associated to two radios sitting in two separate access points. We are using two bonded channels per radio, so 40 megahertz wide channels and Wi-Fi 5 all around. With this being said, we can achieve the MCS 9, which results in up to 400 megabits per second data rates and that translates including the overhead of the protocol with no contention to around 290 megs per second per device tested in our lab with iphone 12s on a very good enterprise grade wi-fi with no one around so in this first example we have two radios sitting on different channels first radio is sitting on channel 36 and 40 and the second radio on the second access point is sitting on channel 44 and 48. So we do not have overlapping there. Each device is associated to each radio and the aggregated throughput of these devices is 580 megs because they do not have to contend for the airtime. And if we take a look at the middle column now where we have got CCI or co-channel interference. And what we've got here is those two devices now using the channel 36 as their primary channel. So we've got a bonded channel here at 40 megahertz, but the primary channel is the channel 36. And now what this means is that these devices have effectively have got to take it in turns to share the medium. So if one's talking, the other one has to back off, wait and listen, and they have to take turns and play the game nicely to access the Wi-Fi medium. And the impact that this has on our devices, you can see that for the throughput per device now, that actually drops down to 145 megabits per second. So we're pretty much at half what we had before. And then the aggregated throughput for the two devices, that actually becomes the same as what it was for roughly around one device. And we're just talking about two devices here now. If we were to add more devices, it's going to get less and less and less as well. And the less and less, like, when you start to think about having, let's say, 10 devices associated to a network, then the aggregated throughput will no longer be 290 if they all try to actively access the medium. It will be less and less and less because of they will retransmit their data by having a collisions more and more. So they will contend for the airtime, they will talk at the same time, they will not have an acknowledgement, they will retransmit, they will waste airtime, and therefore the throughput, real throughput for these devices will be lower. So that's CCI with no OBSS. Now let's talk about what the OBSS is. So OBSS overlapping basic service set on top of the CCI, it's an overlapping on non-primary channels. Now let's talk about what the primary channel is. So primary channel is a channel in a bonded channel that is being used to put all the control and management 
traffic on. So if I have on the channel 36 plus 40, 40 megahertz channel, typically I will use channel 36 in Wi-Fi 5 at least to be my primary channel. Now, some vendors, they allow you to change that setting and maybe you will want to be smart and use channel 40 instead of 36, thinking that you won't be overlapping with your neighbors or neighbors of your neighbors. When that happens, then all the checks, CCA, so clear channel assessment, that all these devices they do before they send data will be done on their primary channels. So for the first access point, all the devices associated to it and the access point itself will see, is there anyone doing something on channel 36? Is there a Wi-Fi preamble, 8.11 preamble on that channel? No, I will transmit. At the same time, second access point might take a look at channel 40 and ask the question, is there any Wi-Fi preamble on channel 40? No. I will send some data and then we will have two or more devices sending data at the same time. And what's going to happen? A massive collision that will result in a retransmission that will result in the devices going back to the contention and having to play the game again while not sending data. All the devices, they will struggle with their speeds. The Wi-Fi will be slow. And with just two devices having both CCI and OBSS on top of that, we are down from 145 to 119 megs per second. Aggregated throughput will go down and down and down very quickly the more devices we add here. OK, thank you, Mac. We have now got some real world examples that we've used with EchoHow Pro to start showing you some examples of how we track down these devices. So uh, first of all, what I want to show you here is that we've got a, a floor plan with a heat map and we can see some icons on the screen. The green icons that we see on the screen, these are our customer's access points. So they belong to the customer. The two white icons that you can see, we've got one of them enabled at the moment, and that's got the blue circle highlighting it. And then the heat map that you're seeing on the screen is from that access point. And actually, what that access point turned out to be was a printer. So the customer, we were there to do a, a Wi-Fi health check survey so to assess the environment because they were having some issues. And we did the survey for them. We reviewed the data and we could see that this printer had its Wi-Fi enabled. So we had a conversation with the customer and we said, hey, Mr. Customer, we noticed that this printer here has got its Wi-Fi enabled. Can you just talk me through the steps that your users take to go and print their documents to the printer? And he was like, oh, I had no idea that this uh, printer had its Wi-Fi enabled. And we said, okay. That's fine. Um, but how do you know? How do you use a print their documents at the moment? Let's say it's just called Echo Corporate, the SSID. And then, you know, they're connected to the Wi Fi. They're on their document that they want to print. They go to file, print, select the print that they want to print to. Then it just traverses over the corporate LAN and goes to the, the printer. And we said, okay, brilliant. Then, so we can definitely turn the Wi Fi off on the printer because it's not like people are disconnecting from the corporate Wi-Fi connecting to the direct hyphen Y zero hyphen studio X30 to print their, their, their documents. And he's like, no, no, of course not. So we were able to show the customer on the floor plan exactly where this device was. And we said to the customer, oh, by the way, like, how often have you updated the, uh, the pre-shared key to you know, access this print? And he's like, well, never. I didn't even know the Wi-Fi was turned on. So it was kind of a bit of an eye opener for the customer. And this honestly happens all of the time with the recent uh, surveys that we've done. We see this so often, these sorts of devices that don't need to have the Wi-Fi enabled that they're turned on. And a lot of the customers, they have no idea that they're even enabled because how often do you, you know, as a customer and in the environment, do you get really check that? Whereas we can now show you on the floor plan pretty much exactly where it is and the impact that it's having on the network. So we can see the coverage from this one printer alone uh, can be heard easily by at least four of those access points and probably even the fifth one. And considering this is working on 2.4 gigahertz and we typically just use one, six, 11, three channels in the UK, you know, it's going to be causing us co-channel interference. So what we needed to do here, disable the radio of the printer. It's going to remove that security, potential weak security vulnerability. And it's also going to improve the performance of the Wi-Fi in that area. And the performance can be massively affected by having printer like this in your environment or 10 printers like this or 100 printers like this. If you have just Wi-Fi enabled, then, you know, it's a Wi-Fi radio. So it will be attempting to send 10 beacons per second per SSID 
uh, per band. So if you have it on channel six, on that particular channel, this particular printer will be sending around 10 beacons per second, contributing to increased airtime utilization. But not only that, with the Wi-Fi enabled like this, you can use it to connect directly to the printer and someone probably will be using that sometimes because that's what they do at home, for example. And if they want to print like a 300 megs massive PDF document, this file will be transmitted on channel six to the printer. And therefore all the devices, corporate devices or guest devices sitting on channel six around the floor or adjacent floors even, they will have to, con uh, they will have to contend with a printer and a guy using that printer for the airtime. Yeah, if, if you've come across this when you've been doing some of your surveys, please let us know in the chat if you've seen something similar. And okay, where do I start with this slide? Mac knows this is one of my one of my favorite examples here. Um, <clears throat> so we were called to do um, a, another assessment of a customer's Wi-Fi network uh, because they were reporting issues that their corporate Wi-Fi pretty much sucked. It wasn't working very well. Um, so again, when we're looking at this floor plan right now, what you can see the green icons are the customer's access points and the white icons are all of the other Wi-Fi devices that are on the floor plan transmitting. Um, let me just break something down for you as well. If we take a look at that top left hand corner green icon, we can see that there is a number and a purple box and a red box next to that. So the number one in the purple box, what this means is that it's using channel one on 2.4 gigahertz and 802.11n. The number below it, channel 116, this means that it's using uh, 802.11ac, 20 megahertz wide channel uh, on five gigahertz. So why is that important? Because if we draw our attention now to either one of those white icons underneath that highlighted, because you can see that there is the channel, there's a channel 36, and then there is an at sign and then a 40. So what this now means is that this device is using channel 36 on five gigahertz, 802.11ac, and it's using a 40 megahertz wide channel. So bonding the two channels together. So the heat map that you're seeing now is just from all of the other access points, not the customer's Wi-Fi access point. So we can see just from all of these devices alone, it's pretty much lighting up the whole floor plan. And what you can see here, these devices in particular, a lot of them are using the 40 megahertz wide channels. So they're pretty much eating up most of the uni one band of the five gigahertz spectrum. So you might be wondering, well, Matt, what, what were those devices? And I'll tell you, so half of those devices on the floor here were the, um, these are all basically meeting rooms and the devices that were on the door, just outside of the doors where you go into the meeting rooms, they're the room booking systems and some tablets before you get in the room. And you could go there, you could see, oh, is the room occupied? Is that, can I book this room? When is it going to be free, et cetera, et cetera. But these tablets all had a cable connected to them. So they didn't even need to have the Wi-Fi enabled for anyone to connect to them. So it's creating lots of channel interference, lots of primary, secondary OBSS as well, like Mac was explaining so well earlier. And it's really impacting the performance of the five gigahertz corporate network. Then the other type of devices that we had here, let's say you go into one of these meeting rooms and they've got a TV there and you want to share your presentation to the screen. Uh, maybe you don't want to plug a cable in. So what these devices were, were these wireless receivers that you can connect to, and then you can share your presentation wirelessly to these devices and it will come up on the screen. But again, you can see a lot of these devices were also using the five gigahertz spectrum. And we know from most of the networks that we deploy recently for all of our customers, they're really moving to be using the five gigahertz spectrum because it's got the, the more channels, the less non-Wi-Fi interference. But actually, this is one of the more unique circumstances we came across where actually the performance on the 2.4 gigahertz was better than the five because 2.4 had less channel interference than the five gigahertz, which was just crazy. So what we did here to help fix the customer's environment was that First of all, the room booking system tablets, we disabled the Wi-Fi on there. We did not need to have the Wi-Fi enabled. And then the media devices inside the rooms, we told them to flip them to be on 2.4 gigahertz, keeping that five gigahertz spectrum more free. And again, by turning off the Wi-Fi on the radios, the devices that you don't need to have them on, that's one less way that people can get access to these devices to get onto your corporate network.
And in that example, 30 less devices sending 10 beacons per second on their radios. So now what do we see here? A few months ago, we went to the site together with Matt and just walked around casually with our beautiful, fantastic sidekicks. And Ekahau has placed something that we can see as being marked as a video camera on a floor plan automatically for us. And in red, now we're looking at the heat map of impact area of this video camera. So these video cameras, they are analog wireless cameras that they just, they are not Wi-Fi, they are still wireless, and they are massively interfering with our, with our Wi-Fi network. So let's flip to the next slide and take a look at what it looks like. So you can see highlighted in red is what Echohaus sees the map. So Echohaus sees a massive amount of energy using the spectrum analyzer built into the sidekick, and then it applies its I wouldn't like to call it artificial intelligence. It's not. It's it's logic to uh, to match the profile with the spectrum that it sees, and then it concludes that this particular interference is an analog video camera, and it marks us marks it for us on the map, so we don't have to do it ourselves. A few years ago, or even several months ago, we had to capture the spectrum data, and then we had to see where the spectrum utilization layer one spectrum utilization hikes are and then we had to identify this interference ourselves now like how can do it for us and we can see that we are using channels 153 161 and 165 which are uni free channels and these are valid wi-fi channels on 5 gigahertz spectrum even in the uk it has been cleared by ofcom so we can use them now and in states the lucky guys there they could have used that pretty much forever but with these cameras on you won't be able to use these channels whatsoever they are blasting the entire channel or free channels in this example with 100 percent of layer one duty cycle so channel utilization is so high that if you have wi-fi access points or clients on these channels no one will be able to put anything in the air because they will be checking oh anyone out there do i see any energy with like a high-ish threshold around like 62 or whatever and they will always see a blasting massive analog video camera and they will just back off and try again yeah so that's the equivalent of me and mac trying to have a conversation and we've got Stu in the background just holding down that foghorn and we're just waiting for him to release that foghorn so we can start trying to have that have that conversation so Put that foghorn away, please, Stu. You um, bet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and what we want to show you here is really the power of the custom template reporting because we can automatically report on these devices. So what you're seeing here is the access points that are not deemed as my access points of the of the customers or your network what these are these are these interfering access points so um, you can quite nicely now if you just build out your custom template report you can run this from your echo project file and what it's going to do is going to place these devices on the map it's going to show you where it is pretty pretty accurately as well it's really good at that and also it's going to show you that impact that it's having so you can see the heat map from these individual devices so it's really really handy and you can see the the ap name and the ssid and what channel it's using and this is number one of our free giveaways that we're giving away on the webinar today we've got quite a few actually so thank you to mr pete mckenzie here because when he heard we were doing our wi-fi security webinar he actually reached out and said hey i've got some custom template um that i'd happily share with you to share on the webinar that you can say to the users, uh, the people watching, please grab a screenshot of what you can see on the screen right now. If you would like to include in your custom template reporting that exact thing you saw on the last slide, this is the code that you need to do it. So hopefully that was enough time for you to grab the screenshot. I'll give you one more second before we move to the next slide. Now, bum. And ladies and gentlemen, have no fear because interference detection is here as i mentioned before you can use your echo hub products and not only echo hub pro now you can use your echo how mobile apps to see that interferers on your tablet or on your mobile phone and it's so mind-bending and i didn't see that coming a few years ago this is just posh to have in your pocket looking into spectrum is so magnificent 
that you can do it on the mobile device. And I just take my mobile device from my pocket, connect a sidekick to it, and I can see that around channel one or two, I have an analog video camera. And you can see in the table below that Ekehau tells me, oh, you have a camera on channels one through four with that amount of power, with that RSSI. And then we can see it's red or dark red or black, which means it kills the channels with around 100% of uh, duty cycle. It's killing it completely. And Ooh. now, wow, <laughs> this is Mr. Matthew having fun at home and using devices that he probably shouldn't. That was a Wi-Fi jammer, jamming entire 2.4 gigahertz band. So all his IoT devices, they were completely killed or his trackpads, keyboards, mouses, everything was completely killed. And we could also see that using our mobile device and a mobile apps that we, that we have as part of the Connect Suite. Yeah, I have to say, I'm probably not on the uh, Christmas Christmas card list with my neighbors when I keep doing this. I can hear them shouting through the walls, what's happening to my Wi-Fi? And I'm turning this on, so sorry to any of my neighbors nearby when I'm uh, doing that testing there. But it is good fun, and it's, um, it's so, so amazing that you can see this on your mobile devices. It's unbelievable. But this really, hopefully, emphasizes the importance to why we need to do health check surveys. You might have heard us talk about the, the three steps to great Wi-Fi, and we're really homing in and focusing on that step three because it's so, so important that we go and do these health check surveys. So many of the customers that we go and see and we've done these surveys at, they had no idea that these devices had their Wi-Fi enabled, and it's such a weak method of access to the corporate network we've got to be so careful these days with the cyber security we need to be getting out there regularly checking see what's happening in our environment um making sure that we can track down these devices reconfigure them remove them also it really impacts the performance of the wi-fi and what me and mac were talking about earlier when the performance of the wi-fi in the place that you're trying to work is not that good we see people bringing in their own home wi-fi grade devices and plugging it into the network so they can try and use the wi-fi at their desk of their cheap home stuff and it's not got great security either so we want to make sure we mitigate and minimize that as possible make sure you're doing your health check survey so you can track down these devices and make sure that your wi-fi in your workplace is fantastic because if it is then people they will not feel the need to connect their own TP-Links and Linksys. Now, your favorite poll will have a poll for you. So here is poll number one. How relevant is wireless cybersecurity in your role? Would you say it was A, not relevant at all, or B, it is sometimes relevant, or C, it is of utmost importance in my role? Okay. We'll just uh, give in. it a few more, yeah, a few more seconds to to let everyone cast their votes on the poll from their favorite poll. I liked what you did there, Mac. I That's a crazy anyone... response, man. Almost <laughs> everyone has voted. I had never yeah. seen that. Okay, cool. It's enough. Okay. Poll number two is about when doing site surveys, do you actively look for security risks? Yeah, quite um, simple here. It's just a simple yes or a no. So um, we're just looking for either a yes or a no for this poll question. And we're going to give some time here for people to answer. I wonder if people that are on the webinar today, Mac, if they actually know you're Polish or they're not getting that joke that you're trying to make there. I don't know. You can probably guess by my accent. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we've got the, the answers are in. And well, that's, a, that's a close call. Yeah. So no okay. and yes, it's very, very close. Not super extremely close, so we are still glad that we are looking at it actively, but we really want to know about the vulnerabilities. And now the poll number three is, if you answered yes, anyone can vote, by the way, what are you looking for the most? Okay, is it A, open wireless access points? Is it B, rogue access points? Is it C, unauthorized devices is it d anomalies in the spectrum or is it e something else and if you answer something else please let us know in the chat what that something else is we have got quite a lot really on the uh, rogue access points there what about 40 40 percent so that's quite I high there that. 
also the unauthorized devices, so devices that they are connected to our network and shouldn't, and anomalies in spectrum, so most likely non-Wi-Fi but wireless interferers. So it means that we have the awareness of the importance of knowing about the location and impact of these devices. So now we know, after this poll, that security is extremely important for everyone, and around half of us engineers, when we are conducting a physical site survey, then we are actively looking for these vulnerabilities. And this is what we are looking for. So great to have that insight. Thank you very much, guys, for, for sharing that with us. I was very interested in the something else. Same. <laughs> the first, the something else. What would that, what could that be, right? Mm -hmm. Aliens, maybe? Aliens? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's move on now then to some Wi-Fi security theory. Let's crack on. So Wi-Fi security uh, theory, we know how important it is for everyone. And we have so many choices, so many options. We have opens, webs, WPA1, 2, 3, and now enhanced open. What do we do with all that? Let's talk about it one by one. Let's start with open. So open, it means that there is no layer two security. There is no encryption on our traffic that we put into into the air and when we put our traffic into the air everyone around us in the same area can sniff our traffic and if it's open it's clear text so if we do not use any additional layers of of encryption there like ssl https if we don't use encrypted email uh, communication then all of that is being seen as a clear text and can be if dropped so be careful with using open networks with no encryption at all yeah, and then um, the the first kind of encryption that came around was the the wired equivalent protection, or otherwise known as WEP. And honestly, guys, this is crackable in seconds. If you have got any of your wireless networks that are currently using WEP, we highly recommend, strongly recommend that you go and increase the level of encryption on those networks. Maybe you're being held back by some of the legacy client devices that still only support web. If you're in that situation, then you should really be talking to your customer saying, hey, you know what, you need to upgrade those client devices so they support something else other than web because it's a real, real security vulnerability because it's so easily crackable. It is. And not only web is easily crackable, uh, WPA1 was like a quick patch for web. So when we have discovered that it's so easy to crack, we wanted to fix it and we rushed it a little bit and had WPA1 using TKIP encryption. And it's also crackable in seconds. And not only that, it's still fairly popular. So it's not something that I don't see at all. We do see that, especially in like warehouses areas, in industrial spaces where you have some sophisticated equipment or a handheld scanners that they don't do anything else. And if you have these devices, ideally you should update them to something else and stick to WPA2 and higher, so two or three. Or if you cannot, then make sure that only these devices are using this particular SSID and this particular SSID has access only to this one legacy server sitting somewhere in your network and nothing else because everyone with a little bit of a know-how or Google can crack your network. So be careful there. And also TKIP is extremely slow. So it's not only unsecure, but it's also slow. Be careful. Yeah, great, great tip there, Mac, about making sure it's, those devices are isolated and only having access to what they need to have access to. So moving on to WPA2, which uses the um, advanced encryption uh, standard. And we've That's got... What it stands for? Yeah. So um, we've got kind of like two two flavors here. And it's uh, we, we've got the WPA2 personal and we've got WPA2 enterprise. We'll talk about enterprise in the next slide in a bit more detail. We're going to focus on the personal right now and, and pre-shared key, because I'm sure this is probably the type of network that we're very familiar with. And um, give you two examples here of where pre-shared key can be quite secure and how it can be quite unsecure. So the first one being is let's say that you've got a corporate network that is using a pre-shared key. Um, but let's say that in this example, uh, only the IT staff are aware of what this pre-shared key is and they're using a long um, character length. So maybe it's like 25 characters and it's only pushed down to these devices via GPO. In this example, yes, it's still crackable offline, but you're going to have to have a pretty 
power hungry device to be able to crack that it's going to take some time so it's quite secure if you do it in this sense and then the other example is that what i've seen so many times you've probably seen it as well that you turn up you go to visit someone in in their office you you go to the reception you sign in you go to the meeting room and you want to connect to the guest wireless network you see that you know there's like the guest network so you connect to it and you're like, oh what's the the password and they go oh, okay here you go and then they just turn around this plaque that's like sitting on the side where it's like guest wi-fi network here's the pre-shared key and it's just printed on a bit of paper on the plaque for everyone to see probably not been updated for a few years and it's not that long so in this example when the pre-shared key's not been updated for a long time it's written down on pieces of paper for people to see this means that Anyone that's nearby, if they know that pre-shared key, they can put that into their favorite wireless sniffing tool and they will be able to see any of that traffic that Mac was talking about earlier, where it goes to any of these unsecured places like a HTTP or unsecured email server. So in that example, it's not very secure. It is not indeed. And now we have a newer protocol, SAE, Simultaneous Authentication of Equals, also called WPA3 that fixes the offline attack possibilities against your traffic sniffed over the air. And now not only we cannot crack it, but well, not crack it off offline, but it also enforces us to use MFP, which stands for a management frame frames protection, which means that we cannot, let's say, attack management frames, forcing all the clients to deassociate from uh, their uh, BSS IDs. And it's great to finally enforce it because we've had it for years. It would be a great feature to use, but since it was not mandatory until now, we just couldn't be bothered and we didn't use it. And now there is a transition mode available to us with WPA3 in Wi-Fi 6. You can use WPA3 for devices cap capable of doing it. And if they are not, you can still stick to WPA2. And then finally, the, something else that's quite new is the enhanced open. And this is using a protocol that's called the opportunistic wireless encryption or OWE. And now this is going to be hopefully what's used for um, guest networks going forward, because this now means that the, the data part is actually encrypted as well. So um, it kind of, it does fix that half the problem with making sure that the traffic's now encrypted. But again, there's still no, still no authentication there. And we are now going to move on to the uh, authentication side of things. Yay. OK, so authentication. Authentication is happening after the encryption layer is happening. So let's say if we have an open network, no encryption, we can still have authentication on top of that. But with our first example, which is open, meaning no authentication, we have just that, no authentication, which means that it's open, open, you go into your a drop down list with Wi Fi networks, you click on the network name. And by the way, our kids will be laughing at us that we had to do it back in the day. Ha ha ha. You had to manually check your Wi Fi network, select it from the drop down list. Wow. Open, open means you click on it and you connect to that network without any further checks. Yeah. Uh, so now just to come back to the uh, circle back to the WPA personal. So for WPA2 or WPA3, um, the personal is this is what you're familiar with when you've got a, a wireless network where you input a passphrase or a pre-shared key. Um, but you might notice we've put something else there called MPSK. Uh, what is MPSK? So that stands for multi pre-shared key. Different vendors refer to this in different ways. So it might be that it's called IPSK or PPSK, so identity pre-shared key or personal pre-shared key. But they're thinking, well, what is this? And actually what this is, is that for one of your networks, you can have multiple pre-shared keys that can be assigned to someone uniquely or to a group of devices. So why is this a, a good thing actually is because that if let's say you create 10 MPSKs for your network, if one of those MPSKs gets compromised, you can just delete that one compromised MPSK rather than having to change the whole pre-shared key for the whole network. And then get all of the devices to re-authenticate with the new pre-shared key. So this is a really good option if your vendor supports it. It is, it is indeed. And also you can rotate MPSKs periodically, like you can you can give them lifetime, like of one day for guests, something like that. So we don't have to worry about them being cracked offline and your network being decrypted for everyone inside your corporate. Uh, okay, so that was personal uh, based on the passwords 
And now let's talk about the enterprise. So enterprise authentication, it's the authentication that uses .1x and EAP protocols with a radio server or against a radio server sitting somewhere in the backend. It can be close to you, it can be very far, but it's it's there. And now there are multiple different EAP methods that we can use. We have EAP TLS, we have EAP PEEP, we have EAP TTLS, EAP LEAP, EAP FAST, tons of them. But today in Wi-Fi, we are using these two most often, EAP TLS and EAP PEEP. EAP TLS is still considered the most secure authentication method because it uses certificates on both sides, on client side and on the server side. So when, when the client associates to a Wi-Fi network, not only the client checks the, val the validity of the certificate presented by the radio server, but also the radio server checks the certificate presented by a station, by a client connecting to the network. So it is ultimately very secure, but also very challenging because you need to have means to put the certificates on your devices, okay? So you need to have a, a PKI, for example, which is a combination of your group policies with your certificate authorities servers, with your wireless LAN policies being pushed down to the devices where you tell the device, okay, install that certificate and then use it to connect to this particular corporate network. It's complicated or you need to have some kind of a management MDM platform um, or something like that. Now, EAP PEEP is also a very, very popular method of authenticating our clients and it is easier than EAP TLS because it uses certificates only on the server side. And by doing it, when you select a peep network from a drop down list or if you have a profile that says connect to that particular e peep authenticated network then your supplicant on your device will ask you to use your credentials username and password typically it will be ad credentials or google credentials or credentials sitting on the wireless plan controller or in the cloud doesn't matter where the credentials sit they will be used to authenticate the device not a certificate so now only the client will check if it trusts the certificate presented by a server in a backend. And what happens when you connect to EAP PEEP network that might be a little bit dodgy, maybe presented by a hacker, okay? Your clients, they will click on that network and they will, you know, their phones or tablets or, or, or laptops, they will say, you shouldn't connect to that because I do not trust that certificate. Do you want to continue? And what would most of users do? They'll say, oh yeah, next, 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 done. I have access to the internet, maybe not through my corporate IP, maybe through someone else's IP that tries to harvest my credentials. And this harvesting of credentials, it's called the honeypot attacks. So I can be in a close vicinity of your office and use directional antennas to broadcast the same SSID as you have in the office using EP, same name, and then I will send the authentication frames to all of your users and they will drop off from the network. And then I will make sure that my SSID, my dodgy SSID is so strong, is so loud that most of the users will actually connect to my dodgy SSID now. And then they will provide me, the attacker, with their credentials that I will then use to attack their emails, their you know one logins, whatever. So to fix that, you need to have two-factor authentication, very important stuff. And then you need to be able to identify these types of attacks. So use wireless IPS, wireless intrusion prevention systems, which would help you mitigate these attacks. So if someone attacks your network using Honeypot, your access points or your monitoring radios, they will take a look at what's happening. They will identify it as Honeypot attack, and then they will not allow the devices to associate to this dodgy AP. So it is able, we are able to fix that, but it's ultimately not as secure as EAP TLS. Yeah, great explanation there about the different types of EAP methods there, Mac. Thank you for that. And we have our free resource. So we have got a beautiful 802.1x EAP spider diagram that we will be giving out to you all for free to be able to download. So you'll um, 
be able to download this later on today. It'll be on the webinar on demand page and you'll get an email that will be included there. Uh, and what this diagram really does, it shows you the step-by-step -step process that a supplicant or a client device that goes to goes through when it's authenticated into a Radius server. So this will be really handy for your studies if you want to try and visualize how many steps are taken for you know going through the process they get authenticated, how many keys are exchanged, what keys are exchanged, when, what they're called this will be for you for free as a free resource. So uh, watch out for that. Make sure you download a copy and keep it for yourself. And now and we're going to talk about- use it a lot. Well, all the time. Graph. Yeah, it's a, it's a great resource. Like, it's hard to remember everything all the time. So when you've got something so visual as that, it really, really helps that you can see, you know, the steps taken. So I absolutely love it. And what we're going to do now is spend a little bit of time talking about our favorite topic, which is guest Wi-Fi networks. And- why we don't like captive portals. So from working in Wi-Fi for a very long time now, <clears throat> we've implemented many Wi-Fi networks that do have captive portals. Uh, so why are you thinking they're coming on here saying, no, let's not use these captive portals? It's because once we have installed these wireless networks, they go over to the customer and they're, you know, handed over, it's working great. And a couple of weeks later, or even a couple of days later, you get, a, you know, some of these starts raising support tickets and you're like, oh no, the, the Wi-Fi was working so well. Like, why do we need to have these support tickets now? And when you start to look into it, the most common cause is because the HTTP redirect page, it does, doesn't always load. And the behavior of this is it could be working one day absolutely fine on Apple devices and all of a sudden there's a software update and it no longer works. Similar for like Android devices, but what is that experience to the user? So let's say that you turn up into the um, what, the, the corporate office that you're going to visit. Uh, you ask to connect to the guest wireless network. They're like, yep, just go connect to guest. You'll um, just put in some details and uh, then you'll be authenticated. So the user, they go there, they, uh, they connect to the guest network. They get the little tick associated. Um, and then they try and go to their favorite application or browse the internet and they've got no internet connectivity. So they go, oh man. Wi-Fi sucks here. The Wi-Fi doesn't work. But hold on a minute. If you're associated to the Wi-Fi, you've got an IP address, gone through DHCP, et cetera, the Wi-Fi is working. You're just not being presented with that captive portal where they're asking you, what is your, what's your name? What's your last name? What's your email address? What's your inside trouser leg? Like, do you accept these terms and conditions, your acceptable usage policy, et cetera, et cetera. So it can cause you uh, a big headache down the line from our experience. The other thing as well is that you're not giving any of your guests when you do this, or typically not giving your guests when you do this, is no over the air protection for your guests. So if you're using captive portals, open networks, uh, there's a high chance that if you get someone that comes in that's not very tech savvy, maybe my nan's coming to visit me in the office and she knows she wants to go and check something and she goes to a not HTTPS, she goes to HTTP, everything that she's sending over the air is going to be in clear text. So if there's someone like Mac in Max Word, dodgy nearby, sniffing the traffic, they'll be able to see that. So it can really become, become an issue and it's not giving you any protection to your guests. So invest in your guests. Also, random Mac addresses. Uh, this isn't a new, new thing. It's been around for a while. Android devices have been doing it for quite a bit, but uh, more recently, Apple devices have adopted the private Mac addresses. And this is though that when, you know, for more security, when your device connects to a wireless network, they're not using its real Mac address, it's using its private Mac address. Uh, well, why is that an issue? Usually the backend systems that are providing you these captive portals, they're looking at the MAC address of the devices to supply the captive portal. So let's just, let's just uh, take an example here that you go and visit your favorite shopping center. You arrive in the morning, you connect to the shopping center guest wireless network, uh, you get presented with the captive portal, perfect. You put in your details, fantastic. You're on and you're online and you're working. You then put your phone back in your pocket or back in your bag. You go and do your shopping, grab a coffee. Uh, you then want to, you know, maybe you've bought like a really nice lunch. And what does everyone do when they have their food now? You've got to take a photo of it and post it on social media. So you take your phone out, you take your picture, you want to post it on social media. Uh, all of a sudden, bam, you're getting presented with the captive portal again. Well, why is this? Some devices might be changing their MAC addresses so often that now actually the back end system is going, oh, this is a new device that's connected. Let me give you this lovely, beautiful captive portal again so you can get re-authenticated. But to the end user, like, oh, this is rubbish. Why? I've, I've already done this once today. Why have I got to do it again? Oh, nightmare. Mac, please, please tell me, is there an alternative that we can have to captive portals? Of course there is. So the most elegant solution is open 
Okay, so if you do not require to have any terms and conditions displayed to your users, your infosec team is fine with that. You are fine with the lack of encryption. You just want to give users the internet access and allow them whatever they want to, to do. And open open is fine. Enhanced open is even better, but it's still getting to the point where the adoption is wide enough for us to start really using it. So it is not mandatory in Wi-Fi 6 yet, and therefore the adoption is not as fast. It will be mandatory in the future. And if you cannot use open, if you need to have some encryption, if you want to present users with something, including terms and conditions, perhaps you have alternatives like you can use MPSK, IPSK, PPSK, whatever you call that. We will show you an example in a sec to present a user with terms and conditions. You have a QR code, you scan it, you connect and life is good. And then you have open roaming that Matt will talk about. But instead of just talking about it, let's take a look at a very quick example. This is one of the companies that does exactly this thing. You arrive at the reception, you have terms and conditions in front of you. You click the button, it presents you with a QR code in the back and it creates a PPSK over the API with the vendor of your choice. You scan it with your phone and bam, you're connected. Life is good, job's done. You are onboarded onto Wi-Fi network within five seconds and you had a choice to agree to terms and conditions, okay? You can you can use it in more agile way where you go to the reception, you say, oh, Matt has arrived, I'm here to see Matt. Matt gets an email saying that Matt is waiting for him at the reception, then I am presented with the QR code and I do the same stuff. And you can also use it for corporate users where maybe just you have an email with a QR code in the email that you scan with your devices and bam, all of your devices are using your own pre-shared key. Fantastic stuff. That is so much more sleeker. Um, and now moving on to open roaming, like Max said, uh, now originally, originally this was kind of started by Cisco and it's based on like hotspot 2.0 and it's now been taken over by the uh, wireless broadband Alliance. And uh, what this is, is let's say you take out your, your, your device, you install a profile on your device. It's like a certificate effectively. And what this does is let's say, again, we go to our favorite shopping center and let's now say that this shopping center has got open roaming configured on the wireless network then that means that the device will automatically connect to this guest network so that's why mac was saying earlier our kids are going to be laughing at us when we said we used to have to go to places and go to a drop down select a guest network to connect to it because our phones hopefully in the future are just going to be doing this for us automatically and it's going to be seamless not only that it's using dot one x etls so it's the most secured method of access to access the wireless network as well so it's seamless it's just, it's secure and we hope to see a uh, a big adoption of this in the future and max got um going to explain a little bit more kind of what happens in the background yeah it's also extremely agile meaning that you can use something called like you have identity providers and an identity provider on the left hand side it can be your a samsung account apple account your ad whatever you're using it can be the identity provider and if you have your credentials your profile that you might want to share or might not want to share with anyone it's up to you and your privacy uh, privacy uh, preferences if you want to have customized experience when you connect to open roaming network in a shop they know your size they know you know your shopping behavior you might want to have customized experience if you don't want to share that you just don't so that's fantastic thing and using identity providers you need to have also a wi-fi network providers so you go to your corporate net to your corporate environments you might have an open roaming enabled network that is uh, called the ekahau uh, open roaming you go to another continent and you go to the hotel and it's called the hotel open roaming or it doesn't even have to have open roaming in its name for as long as it supports open roaming and your client supports open roaming you might be uh, automatically connected to that network so you are using 4g 5g happily outside then you go inside the building and you might not have great reception and at this point your device will just jump onto wi-fi automatically and what do you do you don't care because it happens automatically so we jump between wi-fi between 4g 5g happily you stay connected and all of these beautiful technologies they work together as good friends and that's what we want to have yeah and 
we now have something else that we wanted to give back to you all watching today is some uh, security ninja tips that we wanted to give to you. So we're not going to go through uh, line by line what we think are the, the best practices here. What we'd like you to do again, please grab a screenshot of this and then you can keep it for your reference for your studies. And if you want to use it, by all means, we also threw in two bonus tips at the end, which is to do specifically around client devices and what we do on specific SSIDs that are using different types of um, security method so please take a second just grab a screenshot of this slide and keep it for yourself but that's not the only thing that we've got to give away as well I, I've, I think I've lost count about how much stuff we're giving away for free on this webinar today I'm not sure if we're going to be able to keep it up going forward but we have actually got a swag giveaway so so many of you was asking for an echo house swag store we have got an echo house swag store where you can get tons of great swag if you go to echohow.com forward slash swag store you can find these but actually we're giving away 20 of these echo how hats all you have to do is go on to your social media whatever platform you use twitter linkedin facebook then you need to tag echo how in your post share your favorite echo house security tip from today's webinar for your chance to win and we will be contacting the winners by the end of the week so everyone go onto the social media start posting so you've got a chance of winning a echo how hat and and the bonus thing here is that matt will be packing all these hats himself so <laughs> it will be matt packed hat and extra there'll be extra love being put into those boxes from me to you and that takes us pretty much to the to the end of the webinar so um thank you all so much for staying with us we are going to take some questions and preferably wi-fi related mr Stu gomans gomans sorry if i pronounced that wrong do we have any good q a questions that we can quickly answer for some of the the, the you know today? yeah we do and you know a lot of them you were actually kind of um uh, kicking up there, but there was one that uh, that really kind of um, uh, stood out to me. And this one was actually by Rich and it was, uh, you know, we're in a large retail environment. We, you know, we see many rogue devices, mostly phones and vehicles, you know, that they believe in. Is there a good way to identify these? And, you know, what's, the, what's, a, what's an approach like, you know, how would you approach something like that? As a, as a great question. And uh, the best way to track down and identify these devices is by doing the health check survey. So the three steps, the great Wi-Fi, that key number three there, making sure that you're regularly checking your environment so you can identify when these pop up. If you're in a large, um, you know, shopping environment, yes, we, I've worked in it personally myself for years now. I know how challenging it is because you get those pop-up stands. They've all got their own Wi-Fi. All of the concessions, they've all got their own Wi-Fi as well that bleed out into your Wi-Fi. So it's kind of crazy. Um, all you can do is try and police it as best as possible. But the best way that you can go and identify what these devices are is by getting out there with Echohow and your sidekick and doing your health check survey, seeing if there are any new devices that are here that wasn't here before. Do we identify any devices that don't need to be here? You know, are there staff members that are personally hotspotting their devices? Maybe you can tell them, you know what, well, please don't do that. Personal hotspots is going to create us, you know, interference on our network therefore making it worse for all of our visitors so please don't do that and just connect to the guest network well that, that that's great i mean and it's even leading into some other couple other questions are about even ap spoofing right i mean i mean that's common you know you, you talked about that in one of your earlier slides you know looking at you know uh, are we going to find another device someone decided to put um uh, you know an ap somewhere just maliciously and you know trying to get someone to associate and capture some data right it, it happens so um, some, you know, that kind of falls into that, you know, trying to find those devices. And, and I think what you, you know, what's always important is going out and doing a, uh, an assessment, right? Do a, a kind of a wireless survey and assessment to kind of figure out, hey, what's happening out there? Is there things that we're not, that our, our, our NMS platform is not seeing or maybe seeing? And that can always kind of, it's uh, the same. Yeah, it's the same stuff. It's like, we will be able to identify these devices when we walk near them while doing our physical site survey so it's very important for us to to keep on doing the surveys and keep on looking at these devices and monitor them not only on the software side but also on the physical side to know exactly where they are we have reached the top of the hour so i will be ending the recording of the webinar now but don't feel like you have to leave us straight away mac and Stu, i'm sure you don't mind sticking around for a few more minutes maybe we can tackle some more questions if you want to hang around grab a brew with the ninjas then by all means feel free to stay with us but if you need to drop off 
Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Stu, for doing the Q&A. Thank you so much, Mac. But also, massive thank you to the rest of the Echo Marketing team because there's so much that happens in the background to get these going for you. So I just want to give all of them amazing people a shout out because we couldn't do it without you. And we are so grateful for having everyone on here. And we look forward to seeing you back in two weeks' time if you're dropping off right now. But thank you all so much. Thank you very much.